computer. Yeah, I got sidetracked by that whole thing. So I'm going to start over because this slide is an equal possibility. I'm not saying it's a high probability. Thank you once more. I really appreciate that. And your fellow students, I'm sure, should appreciate that. So now we're recording. All right. And uh, I'll make sure I don't make that error on the second part of it after the break. OK, so I'll just re-record that first. Uh, at the end is what I'll do for those who want to watch it. So I think that's now why I understand you ask if it's going to be put on. Uh, <clears throat> yes, when I finish at the end tonight, you guys that have heard already the first slide uh, notes on uh, St. Luke's don't have to stick around. I will just recap so that'll all be on one video. And yes, that will the entire video with the first slide and this one and every other slide will be posted by 8 p.m. on Friday as usual. Okay, let's start over. This is uh, the Parson Capen House, P-A-R-S-E-N, again, second word Capen, C-A-P-E-N, House. Here's the location, I'll spell that, the state, of course, Massachusetts, M-A-S-S-A-C-H-U-S-E-T-T-S. -T -T Sorry, it's a long, long uh, state name. I think it's the longest name of any state in the United States. M-A-S-S, -S, maybe Mississippi is equal. M-A-S-S-A-C-H-U-S-E-T-T-S, -S -S -E -T -T 1683. Okay, this house was around during the Salem witch trial. So that's one of the facts. And the minister that lived in this house was involved to a limited degree in those, if you don't know what the Salem witch trials were, I don't wanna to spend too much time on any one slide, but I don't think it's irrelevant to at least briefly recap. It was a horrible incident in another town really nearby. I mean, just a few miles away called Salem. That's why they're called the Salem witch trials. And that town went nuts. I don't know. You would say how you it went crazy because uh, some, um, you know, rather overwrought teenage girls who had a rivalry with other teenage girls in the town accused their rivals of witchcraft as a joke or as a way of getting back at them. You know, these things ha can happen even now. But what you don't see, unfortunately, you do see things like school shootings as a result of this. My daughter's school nearly had one really close. And she was there when the guy was arrested with his gun. Oh, that was a day I'll never forget. Not long after um, uh, Parkland. Yeah, it was the same year. She was a freshman in high school. So I don't take these things lightly. But the point is, one thing you don't see is witch trials. <laughs> At least I don't think so. Uh, but she did all over New England and Virginia and other colonies and all over Europe. With the last witch trials weren't until the late 1700s in England. And I think about a little earlier than that in uh, New England. So what caused people to wake up was this incident. 20 innocent female were hung. They were all, I think all teenagers, maybe one was an adult, maybe two of them, hung as alleged witches. And the nearby town ministers, this guy was a minister in this town, um, which is Topsfield, Massachusetts. It's open to the public. This is a National Historic site. This guy tried to get the people, the other ministers in Salem, the, the judges, the ones that were passing judgment, almost all church officials, of course, because they were pilgrims, right? And they had all the power. It was a theocracy. You know what that is. They had all the power. There's no elected representatives. So they condemned the 20 innocent women to death. And the other ministers in towns around them, at least some of them, like this guy, were aware of the overreaction and tried to help intervene. But they, they either they were too little too late or they just couldn't convince the uh, town council or the town elders, they called themselves, the rulers of the church in Salem to stop this madness. And they, they ended up executing 20 innocent people. So this house has a connection with that medieval, that was a medieval action, no question. The whole idea of believing in which is, I mean, talk about in a negative way where you can accuse someone of doing something for whatever reason, you know, made up or, or you know, exaggerated, and then they can end up being executed for it. That's, that's a medieval ignorant concept. So this house was the home to a minister who wasn't quite that medieval, but the house is totally medieval. You drive through rural England now, you see these all over New England, there are hundreds of them, but in England proper, in the small towns and villages, north and south of uh, 
London, not in London proper, you wouldn't see this. There are wooden houses that are even hundreds of years older that are just like this. So this is a late medieval house in North America. Again, rare, but not unique. Like St. Luke's is the only intact one. There are a lot of intact ones in New England and some are open to the public, including the one uh, called the Witch's House in Salem. If you ever get to Salem, Massachusetts, in which the judge who condemned those poor innocent people to death lived. And I think he tried to uh, commit suicide later when he realized the mistake he'd made, or, or at least something happened to him <laughs> afterwards that uh, <clears throat> they mentioned in that house. And that house is a National Historic Landmark, tragic one. Um, so what makes this medieval is the main part of the meaning, all right? There are three features. First, the overhang. That's the only word for it. Some people just say medieval overhang, but that's redundant because it's a medieval feature. Now, why are there a second story projection of a foot to two feet. That's usually the width of these. This is about like 18 inches. So it's always between a foot and two feet of the uh, second story projecting out over the first. Can anybody guess if you were in a medieval city like you know, in England and you're walking down the street right. and all the houses have these overhead, can you water? go ahead. It is for the water, isn't it? Pretty close. Right. I think can you're getting at what happened, could happen to you if you're walking down the street of a medieval town and uh, you know suddenly something- you get the contents of a chamber pot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're human waste of all kinds. We're not just human. All of their garbage and yes, waste, human and otherwise, pets, whatever. There was no sewage, there were no sewers, there was no garbage collection. They threw them out the window. So they would, if they cared enough about their neighbors, and of course, if they didn't, they'd get in trouble. They'd yell, look out below, and the person would duck under the overhang. Quite literally, that is the only purpose, and that an odd fact, but it's absolutely verified. So why in New England did they do this when they didn't have these narrow medieval, this is out in the countryside. By the way, it was in a movie called Witches of Eastwick, um, with, uh, I think Cher was in that, wasn't she? I can't remember now. Uh, Michelle Pfeiffer definitely was in that and a couple other, anyway, it, it was a, a humorous take on a, gen, a generation of witches in this same town. It was filmed here in this town, Topsfield. I've been to this house. It's a beautiful town. This is on the outskirts of the town proper. Most of the town is not this old, but there are a lot of two or 300 year old houses. This one's almost what, close 350 years. So the overhang is a, don't make a wincing sound or a groan. The overhang is a hangover from the medieval era homes these people grew up in. It's what they knew, it's what they grew up with, and, and they just felt comfortable kind of recreating that out in the middle of the wilderness here. So the overhang has no functional purpose in a New England medieval. These are called salt boxes because they supposedly look like houses shaped like salt shakers from that period. So the medieval features are first, the overhang. You don't have to say medieval overhang. It is a medieval feature. And then the high peaked gable. I mean, this is extremely high peak. That's over 45 degree angle, steep. Uh, it's not gothic. Remember that? That's a curve upwards to a point. We've seen plenty of those with all those church slides. So it's not gothic per se, but it's medieval. It's to shed snow, of course. If you know, New England gets a heavy winter snow every every uh, winter for months every winter. The third feature is a massive central brick chimney or you could say a massive brick central chimney either way and that is something you'll see in houses all over Europe from the middle ages all the way through till about the late 1600s these kind of houses were still being built just like this all over northern Europe they wouldn't be built in Mediterranean climates they wouldn't fit there that would be stucco right and plaster but uh, in northern Europe you'd see houses like this being built in the late 1600s so it's, it's the medieval is many of the homes from much earlier in Europe, especially England where they came from. So that's what makes this quote a medieval salt box. Now, one last thing is about the, well, in a way we could segue into the formal analysis now, because for space, let's start with that. This is also overlaps with the meaning. There are four rooms in all of these. I've been in dozens of these and some of them are much older. There's some back from the 1630s that are still standing and not reconstructed. They're all original. It's a pretty remarkable how they survived all these centuries in New England. Um, and in New England, they're wood in the South, the houses are brick and stone, which kind of makes sense with the climate. So there are four rooms. One uh, on each floor, there are two rooms and each one opens up on either side with a fireplace or hearth for, for a fireplace. And it's all from one central brick 
massive brick chimney. So it's a very efficient way of heating the house. And so the children all slept in the same bed with each other, boys, girls, young, old, teenagers, toddlers, didn't matter. And then the parents and other adults, usually multiple generations were in the same house, right? Uh, would sleep in another bed. So there'd be two bedrooms upstairs, one for the children or the adults and one for the children. They didn't have, a, everyone had their own bed. <laughs> and then downstairs were the two common rooms, the kitchen slash eating room. They didn't even say dining room, but it was like, you know, one big open space. And then the living or parlor area, the living room. And that's it. There were four rooms in these houses. And that's the way they were in the middle ages too. Okay. And then we'll, so that's the space. Oh yeah. I didn't say the height. Um, this has a, 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 um, a habitable, inhabitable, <laughs> right? Space, living area in the attic. Maybe that's where you put Uncle Mort if he snores too much, <laughs> you know, or extra guests that you'd have pay you for, you know, lodging to earn money, of course, it might be upstairs. So there are actually rooms, to, uh, living spaces upstairs. So it's a three story house uh, and the ceiling is about uh, uh, the top of the roof, I meant. That's all you have to know. It's four rooms divided, right, on the first two floors and then one large open attic area on the upper floor. So three levels or three stories with a ceiling height of uh, about 30 feet. 25 to 30 feet, but you know, to say nearly 30 feet. Okay, then we have the colors. Well, there isn't a cool color here. This is all natural. That's why I like this kind of architecture. It's all organic. Everything is from local wood, you know, from the local trees. So the wood, of course, is a warm color, as wood always is. The brick is a warm color. Uh, the windows are neutral, of course, because the glass is not stained glass here. No, they didn't have the desire or skill or money to do stained glass windows in their churches or their houses. In the South, they did, but not in New England. So they're clear glass, so they're neutral. There is modeling here. It's the deep shadows underneath the overhang and along the roof lines. The rhythm is obvious, these narrow little windows. The rhythm also extends to the panes of glass, leaded panes. These windows, these original windows, and some of the few pieces of, of glass have had to be replaced, but it's the original leaded glass windows, it's amazing. They've survived all these hundreds of years. So that creates rhythm. Uh, and then these decorative features, the only thing decorative in the whole house, it's not functional, are these little decorative pendants they're called. You don't have to know that word. Uh, it would post if you want to call it, but the right word is actually pendants. Uh, so that creates a little bit of rhythm just at the corners. Otherwise, oh, and the chimney, the chimney has some decorative brickwork you can see there here. So there's minimal ornament, but there is mostly it's the repeated shapes of the windows. And then the textures are real rough wood, real rough shingles, real rough brick and real smooth glass. Of course, there's no cement textures. Uh, it's completely symmetrical, totally balanced. I would argue that if you drew the line down the middle of the second story, it's the same, you know, the roughly the same areas, the top and bottom. Some people might see it as more weighted toward the bottom. Uh, and therefore unbalanced, I wouldn't argue with that. Um, and this is only one mass, really. I mean, you could say the chimney is the second largest, but you, you, it's really one single structure, of course. Um, and then let's see, it's stable and dynamic. Mostly stable on the first two floors, dynamic on the roof line, and stable on the chimney. Okay, let's move on. All right. <clears throat> This is, so I said, we're not only gonna do architecture tonight. So now we're segueing into some of the other types of art from the late middle ages. We're only gonna do a handful, but uh, again, each one of these might might be on, we'll definitely determine which ones are gonna stay on the study list and which ones won't uh, next week or when we do the review. Okay, so this is the next must know, Moses Well, M-O-S-E-S, -S, Well, Moses Well. And the artist's name, he was a sculptor, of course, is Sluter, last name, S-L-U-T-E-R, Sluter. And uh, the date here is 1406. So what are we looking at? We're looking at a set of life-size biblical figures, figures from the Bible, uh, which are on top of or were put, you know, a, you know, carved and then placed. There we go. First, they were carved in a workshop, of course, not on the site, by the artist and his assistant. Sluter was his name. He was of German heritage, by the way. And then they were put or placed, is a better word, on top of a well. And the well has holy water, or is it magic water? You can write it either way, where some people believe they could cure themselves of various illnesses and ailments 
uh, such as um, you know leprosy maybe although probably not too many lepers were, were allowed to come here because no one else would then they were definitely you know discriminated against for obvious reasons in that time and the ignorance of that time there was no medical treatment then for <clears throat> these kind of diseases or someone with a you know a, a club foot or anything like that supposedly there was waters underneath here in the well where if you uh drank the water or bathed it i forget what you say when you you know took the waters is what they called it it depended on you know uh, each swell was run by a different set of priests and they could decide whether you went into the water or you just drank it either way drinking it or going into or wading in the water would they believe some people believe would cure you of whatever ailments you had whether it was a disease or physical disability uh, <clears throat> so that's why this uh, site was popular with pilgrims and pilgrims doesn't only mean the ones that landed in massachusetts that's just a word for people that you know obviously make it a trek to some part of the world where they believe they're going to have a holy experience. So the pilgrims who came here believed about these waters in this well that they could help cure them. And so this was very popular during the Middle Ages, this site. It had been around for hundreds of years before the well. But the well is the main point of the meaning here. Who is this? Well, it's called the Moses Well, so you can probably guess. That is an image of supposedly, now there's some inaccuracy in this, and now we know this, but when it was made, no one knew this. There are some details that aren't correct here, even as per the Bible's description. Moses is described in the Bible pretty, pretty much in detail. So this is what this sculptor, this German sculptor, thought um, Moses might have looked like near the end of his life, if not at the end of his life. How do we know? Well, he lived to be, you know, 70. You can just say an old man. He lived to be an old man. He's clearly, this guy's elderly. And he went blind toward the end of his life. And I think you can see this guy yeah, isn't even trying to see, right? His eyes are shut. And then he's got the Ten Commandments in one hand. And his beard has grown extra long. These are all clues that mark it as not only Moses, but Moses at all. And the longer the beard, remember we talked about this with all the way back to the ancient Egyptians, the wiser and more important the person was. So long beards indicate that it's near the end of his life. But wait a minute, what about these things? Does anybody know what these are? Forehead there. They're supposed to be horns. And he was never described in the Bible as having horns. That's what a demon or devil would have. So how did that happen? This is the only other major fact about the meaning you should have in your notes, uh, which is that the Bible was translated several times from the original Hebrew, right? And then into Greek and then Latin, you see several times in various languages. And when it was early on, one of the first translations misinterpreted the phrasing in the Bible, which said that Moses had rays of light emanating from his forehead because God made him a holy person. So the divine light of God would come out of his forehead. That's already a bit odd, isn't it, to think of how would that look? You can't do a sculpture with that because light you can't capture in a sculpture. So somehow that got translated to horns of light. And then eventually by the time it was translated into German and English and French, all the main European language, it got dropped to just horns that Moses supposedly had horns. And he never did in the Bible nor in real, I'm sure not in real life. I mean, it's just a misinterpretation, a mistranslation. And it gets got continuously carried over from one you know, country, one century to another. Even Michelangelo, his statue of Moses, which came later, well, not much later, yeah, about a hundred years later in Italy, uh, it's very famous, second largest after David of all his sculptures. Uh, that has horns because he thought that was the right description, but it's not, it's just a mistake, a misinterpretation uh, or translation error. Okay, and then this is King David, one of the early kingdoms, uh, sorry, kings of Israel here. And then up here we have angels, and these angels look like don't they look like they're upset or even just worried about something? I'm not sure what it is they're worried about. They're looking down on these figures from the Bible. And there are various other, you don't have to know about the other ones, other holy figures, all done by the same sculptor and or his assistants. Sluter was his name. And, uh, and then they have the original paint on them. So let's do the formal analysis. The colors... On uh, Mo, you don't have to write about Moses, by the way, if it's on the, the, the test and you have to do a formal analysis. Are cool on his inner robes and the tablets he's carrying, right? The Ten Commandments. 
and warm on his outer robes and uh, his beard and his face. The Simeon texture is superb. It really is well done. That's why he was chosen, of course, to make this sculpture or this whole set of figures, uh, even though the horns aren't accurate. His face, uh, his, his long double beard, really, or you know, divided beard here, the robes, all of that's done superbly with carved line, of course. There's no other kind of line here. Uh, and then we have uh, the um, fact that it's really, I guess you could say it's two masses, him and then the, the Ten Commandments. For space, it's life size. It's a figure about six feet tall with overlapping of his clothes over his body. Obviously, his beard overlaps his chest and his hand overlaps the tablet. So it's real space except for the technique of overlapping. The modeling is just the shadows whenever the sun uh, hits it. Uh, so there's no technique for modeling. And then we have, uh, it's completely symmetrical as in you know, most intact human bodies would be left to right, top to bottom, right? Um, and is it stable or dynamic? Yeah, I'd say it's mostly stable. What you have here is some dynamic detail. Yes, over the top of his head there and some of the folds of his robes. And of course, those create the rhythm here, right? The folds of his robes and the two halves of his beard, his two eyes and the two tablets. Uh, so there's a lot of rhythm. Um, and let's see, we covered space. Oh, textures. Yeah, the textures are simulated here. A simulated uh, cl cloth on his robes, stone on the tablets, skin and hair on his uh, face and beard. I will make one quick observation. This is what a student told me, and we'll go on to the next muscle and then we'll take an early break. Um, can you imagine what it would have been like to travel with Moses going to the Bible? It was 40 years that, that supposedly his, you know, the Jewish people, when they got free of the Pharaoh, right, supposedly wandered throughout the desert. I'm not coming on whether that's accurate or not. That's each person decides what they believe. That's that's your business. But just imagine if you could what it would be like to have been traveling with him every night at you know the pitch dark midnight. You'd be woken up by these rays of light or horns of light coming out of his forehead. It, you couldn't sleep in the same tent if you were with Moses. So people would have had to say, well, turn out the light, somebody, oops, oops, no, forget, just Moses showing off. Supposedly God did that to him as some kind of sign that his people would believe he was the holy person they should follow all the way around the entire Middle East for 40 years before they finally found so-called, right, um, the promised land. Um, Israel. Okay, let's go to, I'm going to do, I'm going to just go ahead to see, hmm, let's think about this. Yeah, these next ones, I'm going to give you one last definition that applies to, to a three of the next four slides. And then I think we might as well take an extra early break and then we'll end extra early because they kind of all go together and I'd rather not do one and then do the other three that are similar or related, uh, you know, in a separate uh, portion of the, of the lecture. So we can take an early break, which will take us, let's call it, it'll be almost 745 by the time I finish giving you this definition. And that way you'll have it on your notes before we start the meaning part of the first must know after the break, okay? And that is, um, <clears throat> here we go, international style. The international style, okay, was a style of late medieval art, or painting, specifically painting, sorry, late medieval painting in Europe. A style of late medieval painting in Europe, which had three features. You're going to see this when we do the must, you know, the, 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 uh, the meaning, I mean, of the remaining slides after the break, okay, which had three features. Number one, gold backgrounds. Well, you can see that in this, and we'll talk about it right after the break. So gold backgrounds, all, all of these paintings had at least some part of the background had gold, real gold. I don't mean just the color, but the actual gold. So gold backgrounds, number one. Number two, an unrealistic depiction of space or depth. And that's going to be clear again. Let's wait and see how that looks when we get to the analysis of these uh, next few slides. So again, the second feature is an unrealistic, uh, you could even say inaccurate depiction of space or depth. And the third is uh, depictions of various holy figures, including Mary, 
right? The mother of Jesus, Jesus and uh, angels and other holy figures. I'll say it again. So a depiction of various holy figures, including Mary, Jesus, angels, and other holy uh, figures. Again, those put three to put together features, I'm sorry, three features all put together in the same painting would mark that as a an international style painting. That's going to be true for three of the next four slides and not true for the most important slide, which I'm going to tell you right now, don't, don't disappear because we went in quite early. And then if you didn't see or just want to hear the recap, I will end by uh, for those who want to stick around, uh, just restating the, the notes for the first slide that weren't wasn't recorded. Okay, so that'll be on the same recording. But the point is that you're going to hear how these next three slides relate to this. And then the one that doesn't is very high possibility. It's called the Lamentation. You'll see it on your syllabus there uh, because it's the most skilled of all the paintings of this entire class that we've ever seen in this semester. It's 100 years ahead of its time. I'll explain how after the break. Okay, let's take a 15 minute break. All right, see you guys at eight o'clock. And now I'm gonna pause the recording. Thank you for your reminding me about that. Okay, okay. Uh, let's resume where we, we left off. Um, I've already given you guys the definition of the international style, so I won't repeat that, um, which applies to the next uh, three slides. <clears throat> so, this one is uh, virgin and child enthroned. Virgin and child enthroned. That's to be on a throne, right? And that word is E N T H R O N E D. Okay, here we go. Let that person in. Welcome. We're just getting started with the first of the remaining must knows. Virgin, right? The word virgin and child and throne. Again, one more time. It's spelled E N D H R O N E D. The artist's name is Chimabue. I know it looks like Simabue. That's how they'd say it in Indiana. Chimabue is the Italian pronunciation. Uh, his last name is C I M A B U E, 1280. Okay, so if we look closely at this, you might notice that there's something endearing about it. Let's get up close to Mary. What is the Virgin is Mary, mother of Jesus? If that's not obvious, you should write that. Uh, of course, that's the main part of the meaning. The scene depicts Mary, mother of Jesus, and her baby, in this case, more like a toddler, really, on her knee or in her lap, right? And they are both up in heaven. They call this the throne room of heaven. You know, it's an odd concept to me. But anyway, the idea that there is a room in a, you know, a place called heaven somewhere up there in the space uh, in, in, in the sky, which is where all these holy figures reside, right? Um, <clears throat> unless they choose to come down to earth, of course. So there she is in heaven on her throne, in the throne room of heaven holding her baby Jesus, who in this one looks much more like accurately, though, I think this is Chimabue, I should say this is another part of the meaning, was one of the best of all of the late medieval painters. In other words, one of the best international style painters. This is so obviously international style, it should jump out at you that way. But if it isn't obvious, again, this is always, the style as always with any work of art, any of these slides that could be on the test is always part of the meaning. So is there a gold background? Oh yeah, that's real gold. Of course, it's painted on to a wood. If it's not obvious, it's a wood panel. They didn't have canvas painting this far back. That's a Renaissance invention. So these are almost all uh, holy images. You can call them icons if you want. In a way they are. Remember, we define what the word icon is. It's on your list of terms to know. And that, that could come up on the final. But most people would just you know say that it's a, you know, a holy painting or scene on painted on wood with real gold paint where you see behind her and around the angels and all the halos on each of the, all the figures have halos. Those are real gold. So it's got the gold background. And then it has uh, the religious figures we already mentioned. Well, there's Mary, Mother, Jesus, Jesus himself and angels. 
that's pretty much it. Let's let's just double check here. I think I got yeah. Oh, whoops, I misspoke. There, yeah, there are four other holy figures. They are rabbis from the Bible. After all, you know the first part of the Bible, the Old Testament, was written by Jewish scholars, uh, and so and it was in Hebrew. So these are you could just say Hebrew or Jewish, either word. Um, prophets from the early part of the Bible. You can just say the, if you want to write the right word is old towards Testament, but you could just say the early Bible and they are holy figures too. And here they are depicted down under the throne of Mary. So they're up in heaven. They're just not as high up as the angels, I guess, around Mary. Okay. But they have halos. If you look closely, they have halos. Okay. So these are all the holy figures. That's the second feature of all international style. And the third is an unrealistic depiction of space or depth. Well, that definitely applies here. Whoops, sorry, let's go back down. You can see that there's there's no diminishing uh, size here on these angels. These, these angels in the back are several rows behind the front ones, and they're all further behind us than Mary is. And so the proportions of her face or head, actually her head, uh, maybe even to her, to her son's head, but certainly to the angels around her are not accurate. And of course, there isn't any scientific or atmospheric perspective. They knew atmospheric perspective in Rome, but by the Middle Ages, it had been forgotten. And of course, scientific perspective didn't exist until the Renaissance. So that isn't even possible this far back. So you don't even have foreshortening here, though. Now, that technique was known, but it's just not, it's not used here. So the only technique for space, and we'll do the formula in just a minute, is overlapping. That's it. And it's not even very, you know, detailed in that regard. So there really is not much of a real, there is no realistic depiction of depth or space in this painting, marking it therefore as a good example of the international style. But one thing I said earlier, just a moment ago, I mean, was about Chimabue being one of the better ones. His facial features, or you could say expressions on his main figures, that's probably a better way to say it. I'll restate that. Uh, Chimabue painted the expressions on his main figures in his painting with more life, more lifelike, more emotion showing than most of these paintings or painters, I should say, of the international school did. Most of them had rather stiff and formal uh, poses and expressions on the faces of the main figures. Here, at least you see some some life, you know, it uh, does look like a mother proud of her, you know, young baby. Well, it's, like I said, more like a toddler there like he's about five, four or five years old. And even the angels have some emotion, right? Especially these ones over here that are smiling. This one mostly, yeah, and then this one. So there's, you know, Chuma Boy was a, a, a cut above, you could say, or, you know, a notch, however you want to write that, to a degree above the other, most of the other painters of his era, of the late Middle Ages or international style, international era of painting. Uh, this style was used all over Western Europe. That's why it's called international. In fact, it was even used in Eastern Europe. So that's what they mean if you're curious when they say international. There weren't really nations then, so in a way, that's not a good term to use. It can be confusing for people that are, you know, just starting to learn about this period of history. But it's what they've come up with, and that's the term used in Stockstead and most historians. So we'll use it too. Okay, and you do have that definition of the features, of course, I re sort of recapped them, recapped them um, somewhat in this analysis. Now let's do the formal elements here. Uh, this painting is balanced. Equal number of angels on either side, Mary and baby Jesus in the middle. And again, an equal number of range left to right of the prophets, the Jewish prophets below. With the throne pretty much dead straight across the middle, it's balanced. I would argue left to right and top to bottom, depending on where you draw the line. Okay, the rhythm is obvious. The halos, the heads and arms and upper bodies, if you want to say actually upper bodies is better, of the main figures and then on the, uh, of the angels. I mean, and on the two main figures, you see there are their full bodies, feet, hands, heads, shoulders, of course. And then the rhythm of the throne and the robes every figure is wearing creates a lot of rhythm. It's mostly stable. The halos, I know, and the slight tilt of the heads may make these uh, details look dynamic, but the angels' bodies, most of them, are standing upright, 
She's sitting upright. The throne is upright. And even baby Jesus, except for the lower half of his legs, his body is mostly upright. So it's mostly stable with dynamic details like the bottom of the throne, of course, uh, and the halos. <clears throat> the simia texture is pretty good here on the robes, sorry, right? Uh, and uh, on the hair. And I would say not that good on the throne. I mean, what's that? You can't even tell. Is that supposed to be stone or wood or clay even? It just looks like it could be ceramic. You know? uh, it's not clear what the material of the throne is. So that isn't very realistic. But on the figures, both the, the, well, all of them are holy. So let's just say on all the figures, uh, it's pretty realistic on their skin and their hair and their clothing. What isn't are the colors. The colors are cool, gold, so that's warm in the background. Of course, all the halos are gold. The throne is warm. Mary's wearing blue, which I forgot to mention part of the meaning. Always, always, she's shown wearing blue robes. Her outer robes are blue because that's a color of royalty. She's called the queen of heaven, at least I think the Catholic Church definitely does call her that. So she's supposed to be like, you know, holy figure and royalty. So she's got blue on. That's obviously cool of course but then jesus's brown and red robes are, are warm as are the undergarments or a garment maybe just one long robe that mary's wearing the outer robes were always blue on her but not the inner ones and then their skin tones whoa wait a minute what have we got there that's part of the meaning and it's part of the formal analysis they overlap something's not realistic that looks like dead flesh i think we covered this with the icon of uh right? Yeah, from 1100 in Istanbul a few weeks back. Uh, so it's something to be aware of if either that or this slide is on the final. The skin tones in late medieval paintings, religious paintings or, or otherwise, well, that's all there was. was religious. So you can just say late medieval paintings on all the main figures were not lifelike. The skin tones had a dead flesh. <laughs> I mean, I think that's not overstating here, but there are two theories as to why. One is that the original paints had impurities in them. And so they may have had this odd, sickly or deadly greenish gray cast. That's how I describe it, a greenish gray hue or cast to the skin tones that from the beginning looked like that. The other theory, and we can't know, there was no color photography, so we don't know, is that it just turned to the, that way over the centuries, that the uh, pigments in the paints used at that time, they didn't have oil paint, right? This, no, it was hundreds of years later, oil paints weren't even thought of. So these earlier paints, you don't have to know. They were egg-based. Some of you know if you studied painting. Actually, I know several of you have uh, used egg-based temp um, tempura paint. I've seen people using them in the in studio classes in Natalie Hall when we all used to be in person classes. So you could just say that it's possible, the second theory is, uh, that, that the tones of the skin colors changed into this you know, deadly greenish gray color over time that discolored, right? No one can say for sure which theory is correct. Okay, and then we have, uh, let's see, the lines are all thin, painted, of course, outlines. I don't really see any bold outline. Maybe some people might think along the bottom of the throne, maybe, but that's about it. Uh, and then we have um, the largest mass. It's a close call, but I'd say it's Mary. You could say the throne, but this to me is not part of the throne. It's, it's a separate structure. So if you see that as one thing, you could say the throne and then Mary. And then it's either the two angels in the front or baby Jesus. Pretty close call. And for space, I've already mentioned, the only technique at all here is overlapping. There's not even really foreshortening. I mean, there could be here, but when you look at that, it doesn't, doesn't have any smaller, narrower size or width, I should say, the width of the back end of this curved base of the throne. There's not really any of the technique of foreshortening that I see anywhere on here. Okay, I think we've got that all rhythm, space, texture, smarming. Right. Okay, moving on to the next. Um, I do know I, I cut things, so you guys get a break on this one, all right? But I'm going to show it to you to make the point I just made. We'll keep this brief. Um, because the, the last two, the very last one, is the one we, we need to take the most time with, and it has a very high possibility of being, I'm giving you guys a strong clue, of being on either the slide ID or slide essay part of the final. 
but not this one. I took it off the syllabus. Uh, this is another virgin and child in throne. If you ever go to the um, Legion of Honor Museum, it's, it's open again now. I'm planning to go sometime over the summer to see the exhibit on Pompeii. That's a good one. You could still go there before, of course, the final exam week is over and get extra credit uh, on artifacts from the actual site of Pompeii that was buried under the volcanic eruption. Anyway, another thing you'll notice if you walk through the medieval wing is room after room after room of the same themes on those paintings from the late Middle Ages. They're international style. Most of them are not as famous. These are from Italy, from museums in Italy, where they were created. The early ones started in Italy. Uh, this is before the Renaissance. So here we have those same features. That gold background, you have to write this down, right? Because you've already taken the notes on the last one. So this is just another example, but it's an inferior one. Because here, I, I don't know about anyone else, but I, that does, I mean, maybe it sort of looks realistic, but there's something a bit odd about the expression. Plus the color of the skin has turned even dark. So either the, the paints were even inferior to the ones used by most painters like Jim Abue, who are the most successful painters, and therefore discolored even more, or they were that way to begin with, and therefore the, the painter wasn't taking care or caution to try and avoid this dead flesh look. <laughs> And then there's, you know, almost the exact same expressions on these faces of these angels back here. Now here there's slight differences because these are maybe actual portraits of, of uh, Catholic church officials, but not that much difference. So it's not as, as skilled. This, this painter was no, it's Bonus, Bonin Segna was his name. You have to know it. I took it off the syllabus, of course. But it just shows a difference. It, you know, even though we're looking at the same style, whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, nonetheless, there's a, a significant difference in the realistic features, at least, of the main figures, if not the entire paintings between these two painters. And they're within the same generation. That one was, this one is, is actually 1300, and the other one was 1280. So you see that there were better and worse, there were superior and inferior, of course, levels of skill in painting, even that far back. Okay. Next must know, this is on the syllabus. So you do need to take notes. Okay, the title is February from the Book of Hours. The month February, of course. F-E-B, of course, you probably know, R-E-U-A-R-Y. I just like it's usually spelled. February from, you don't have to write the word the, unless you want to, Book of Hours. That's the title. The artists were two brothers, French brothers, named Limburg, L-I-M-B-O-U-R-G, Limburg Brothers, plural course, and it's 1416. So this is international style with a difference. You might think at first, well, wait a minute, how can it be? Because there are no holy figures. Well, yes and no. The gold background is on the calendar. It's there, all these numbers and, and letters, well, at least many of them, and certainly all of the framing of the calendar dates, that's real gold, as is the sun shining down from and, and the, these uh, hills. That's real gold. And so is the entire border of the painting. So there is gold background. And then what's the holy figure? Well, it's a little bit debatable because that's supposed to, to symbolize the Greek god Apollo riding his chariot and bringing the sun up every morning. You know that myth, some of you, right? That, that's how the sun rises. Apollo carries it in his chariot or his cart. And this gets a cart, right? Across the sky, starting in the morning at the rise of the sun, sunrise. So that's a kind of a mythological, or you could say ancient holy figure. And then the unrealistic depiction of the space, it screams that at you. We'll say how when we get to the formal analysis. So th there isn't a realistic depiction of the space in this painting. It's laughably unrealistic. But let's talk about the scene. The scene is the first winter, as part of the meeting now, first winter landscape since ancient Roman times in European painting. That's a major statement. I imagine some will disprove it, but no one has yet. I'll say it again. This is the first winter landscape scene in all of European painting for over a thousand years since the fall of Rome. Or, yeah, right, yeah, over a thousand years. Rome fell in the 400s, so this is over a thousand years later. It's bizarre to think there were no, I mean, winter landscapes every year. There are winter landscapes in, even in Italy, every part of Europe, even Greece, it snows, right? 
I don't know why, but apparently people didn't feel like painting winter landscapes. During Roman times, they did sometimes in the villa walls and things, but not since the ancient Roman times had there been a winter landscape, at least not a known. So this is the first known winter landscape in over a thousand years. And it depicts a scene on uh, of peasants, serfs, the right word. They were slaves. They were definitely slaves. They may not have put in chains. That's true. There were definitely differences between that and chattel slavery, but it is slavery because serfs had no rights, no freedom. And if they tried to escape, they could be hunted down and brought back and tortured or even killed. And uh, that was all up to the noble, the noble families that ran these estates. So these are, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, I have to take a drink of water. <coughs> Peasants working on the estate of a powerful noble. They are his property. In other words, literally, they are his property. What are they doing? They're taking a break in this smaller, um, I mean, sorry, I meant closer scene inside a barn. These three women have been working. Look how tired they are probably from since sunrise. And so they're taking a break and warming up by the fire. Here comes another one who's chilly. Obviously, look at her treading through the snow to join them. And she's wearing 1960s era go-go boots. Now, don't you don't know what I mean, most of you, but that I'm not exaggerating. That's how stylish boots looked in the 1960s that were on TV, all these pop music shows that were on, like Dick Clark and all that. Quite literally, those boots don't belong in the 1400s, but there they are. So she's wearing some kind of oddly modern looking boots, but of course, it's just a, a nominally uh, an exception to prove the rule. She's otherwise dressed in rags, of course. Now, these women look like they're well, this woman's dress is nicer, but still they're definitely not um, well off because they are indentured servants is another phrase for it, but serfs, S-E-R, not S-U-R-F, is what these people are. Peasants uh, tied to the land owned by their masters, slaves in essence. Okay, and then we have this guy who's also one of those serfs, and he's uh, assigned, let's get up close, to chop down wood in this huge forest well, here's the first example of many, but we'll just look at two examples, well, actually three, of the in, unrealistic or inaccurate depictions of space that's typical of all international style painting, okay? He's as tall as the trees that he's trying to chop down. He's as tall almost as that tree. These trees would, I mean, what kind of a forest would have trees that are barely seven feet tall? So there's no proportion here, no accurate depiction. But my favorite, inaccurate detail is this giant of a man and his donkey if they keep going do the math down this path with the little bits of, of you know minor amount of distance left when they get to this town he'll be taller than a church steeple he'd be as tall as godzilla when godzilla attacked tokyo or new york or wherever it's just off and it, there's no effort to do that because these artists didn't understand those concepts the, the diminishing size is off completely. Uh, there is no effort. And of course, they didn't know scientific perspective yet. But even atmospheric perspective, I, I wouldn't call that atmospheric perspective. Some people might, but I don't see it as atmospheric perspective. It's just the you know, colors of the you know, stone wall on the church. And uh, there isn't really any kind of misty, hazy look on the mountains and the snow peaks. It's, so there's only overlapping, and there is here some foreshortening when it comes to space. So now we'll do the formal elements. This fence, you'd have to say, does somewhat have that. And the the uh, roof on the uh, sheep pen does have foreshortening. So this artist, these two brothers, actually, is two French brothers. By the way, this is one of 12 paintings, I forgot to mention that, that were done, one for each month of the year, each one showing a different scene of how those poor peasants had to work themselves to death. Each month, they had different tasks, of course, for their master. So they're shown either, you know, in the process of working or just having finished working. This could be the end of a long work day and they're getting ready to go, you know, eventually cook their own dinners probably uh, with whatever slop that the master gave them to cook. Um, so it's hard to say, but it does look like it's late afternoon. So this is the February page out of the 12 pages, of course, in this illustrated manuscript. Uh, remember the word illuminated manuscript. This is an example of an illuminated with an eye manuscript in which the scenes are hand painted in ornate detail. And they have some, in this case, not religious meaning, but just a functional purpose. 
to mark the years, the, the, the seasons of the year and the days of each month so that the peasants can do their jobs and the master can keep them, you know, on time, on schedule, if you want to put it that way, for their tasks, whether it's planting, sowing, harvesting, what have you. Okay, um, so let's do the rest of the form analysis. I just did the first elements of space. So there's overlapping everywhere. That of course is something that every culture has been able to produce in art when they depict space. So that's you know reasonably well done, but the diminishing size is completely inaccurate. And the foreshortening is limited to the foreground, to this one sheep pen here and to this fence. Uh, the rest is just overlapping. And then we have the similar texture though, that is really well done. These, these two brothers were quite good at that. Um, and, and this is brick, right? That's very realistic. These are of course uh, beehives, that should be obvious. Uh, and then the wooden barn here, the interior of it with the open wood paneling and wooden beams. And then this set of uh, wicker, I assume it's wicker, I don't know what else it would be uh, on the fence and the sheep pen, that's pretty realistic and the clothing on the, the human figures. Okay, that's all done with a uh, uh, painted line. There, there's, I don't see any um, bold lines here. There's all the lines are thin outlines. The largest mass, well, that's hard to say. Maybe it's the barn, maybe it's the kiln. That is a kiln. Uh, it's a close call between the kiln and the sheep pen, but I think the barn is larger. So probably the barn is first and then either the uh, sheep pen or the kiln. Uh, and then I guess it would be uh, this woman here coming across the courtyard. Um, the rhythm is obvious, the repeated shapes of the arms, hands, legs, heads, and of course the details on the fence and the beam ceilings here and the trees and the forest. There's a lot of rhythm. Is it stable dynamic? Well, it's too hard to say one is more than the other. Uh, it's a mixture. Obviously dynamic on the uh, kiln, and I would say the barn because of the diagonal lines of the uh, beaming here, and even to some degree on the roof of the sheep pen and the outer fence. But then the human figures are either sitting or standing upright. The walls of the barn are, are straight upright uh, and the trees. So it's, it's both, it's a mixture. The colors cool on the background on the landscape itself. Up here though, it's a mixture of cool on the sky and warm gold, actual gold again on this uh, sun and the rays from the sun and, and most of the letters and numbers in the calendar up above. Um, and then warm on the kiln, of course, in the fence and cool on the clothing of these uh, three women, well, actually all four of them on their, uh, at least most of their clothing. And of course there's uh, the warm color of skin tones on their faces and hands. Uh, and then let's see, balance. Yeah, I'd say roughly balanced left to right, but unbalanced toward the bottom, except that if you count this as part of that scene, it's pretty well balanced uh, from this courtyard and the upper scene of the heavens, quite literally the calendar section. So I think of it as balanced both left to right and top to bottom. Okay, let's go to the last must know. And if I had to pick one slide tonight, I've said this before, so hopefully if one or two people that didn't stay with us, are going to catch this when they watch the uh, replay of it because it's very likely to be on the final. This is a remarkable, I would even go so far as to say almost mind-blowing work of art. It's over a hundred years ahead of its time. Here we go. It's our last must know for this semester. Unless I find, I probably will, the um, slide that I couldn't produce in the time I had for tonight, which is Sainte Chapelle. I may start with that next week. That would be the very last one, but this is the last painting and the last really important one that is definitely not going to be cut from the study list when we do the review next week, okay? The title of this is two words, The Lamentation, L-A-M-E-N-T-A-T-I-O-N, -E The Lamentation, Giotto, or as my dear departed aunt from Kokomo, Indiana would say, Giotto, G-I-O-T-T-O -T -T -O, is pronounced Giotto in Italy. Uh, and the date is 1306. So here we have a painting. Let's back up for a second. You'll see my point at a glance. This painting is, we just did it, 1416, 110 years earlier. That's why I say there's no question a century is a conservative estimate. 
this painter was easily a hundred years ahead of his time. And we'll say why that's the main part of the meaning as we go along. But what is the scene? It's a scene from the Bible in which after Jesus's body is taken off of the cross, his mother mourns his death. That's her, Mary. She's wearing blue again. Remember that's symbolic for being the queen of heaven. Now she hasn't died and gone to heaven yet, but she will be. And then the other Mary, the one that gets ignored and overlooked so much in so many uh, references to the Bible, but she, she was there. Mary, the other Mary, you could just say that, or Mary Magdalene. I don't think we need to spell that. You write it how it sounds. The uh, only female disciple. And then we have Peter. We know Peter is Peter. This image or figure is Peter because he was the oldest disciple and he had uh, you know, a long beard and gray hair. So that's Peter. And this is one of the others, maybe Matthew, one of the early disciples. So out of the 12, there's three of them present two of whom we can identify, Mary Magdalene and Peter. Actually, when you add her, it's 13 disciples, right? If you got to add her to the, because most of the time they ignore her. So that's how they get 12. So actually there were 13. So you see three out of 13 disciples and then the others are just mourners. And these are not actually meant to be portraits of real people, but let's get up close. Look at the realistic emotion depicted on every figure's face. The mourning, lamentation, by the way, is another word for the mourning, as in to mourn, obviously not the time of day. There's, there's grief. Even on the angels in the sky, they're flipping backflips, or they're doing them, some of say, doing backflips of grief. That's a phrase I would use. You can use whatever phrase you want. Quite literally, some of them are just going back and forth in the sky in various, you know, paroxysm is that the word various states of grief over seeing this holy person dead body down on earth but that's just one of the facts about the meaning the scene itself that's an important part of the meaning but the more important part is what makes this 100 years ahead of its time this is a scene that is painted from a man who never left italy giotto never left italy and yet somehow he describes i've been to this part of israel the Valley of the Kings, I know it sounds like the one in Egypt, uh, some people call the, 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 the uh, Valley of the Royal Tombs, there are different ways for it. It's a part of the mountains that are outside Jerusalem's walls, which back then were no, no houses, now they're developed and you know, houses and buildings around. But back then they were barren cliffs and there was a canyon where all the early kings of Israel were buried and they called it the, the, the Valley of the Kings. And there's a similar one, of course, in Egypt for the Pharaohs. This man couldn't know what it looked like, but boy, did he capture it. I've been there and I can tell you, it looks very realistic. It's a mystery of history. How did he know what it looked like? The most we can guess is he talked to some crusaders, but you know what? The crusades have been over for a hundred years. So that doesn't jive. Maybe someone who's father or grandfather had been a, one of the last crusaders maybe one of them drew a sketch while he was you know posted with the crusaders in israel that's stretching <laughs> we have no evidence of that so no one knows how did he know how to paint this scene with the landscape behind everyone the background so accurately it's always like no one knows but what we do know is his skill as a painter was unmatched he was the greatest painter in europe during his lifetime in the human emotions he depicted, the lifelike poses or, uh, you know, body language. You could say it either way. Look at the, you know, the grief here on each of these figures and the way their, their bodies are posed or positioned. Realistic body language and expressions. And then the skin tones. He's not showing that green color, or that dead looking flesh. And again, no one knows how he could have figured that out, how to mix the paints in a way that didn't then either start out or eventually fade over the years into the uh, deadly looking green, grisly greenish gray that we already talked about. His skin tones not only looked obviously from the beginning lifelike, but stayed that way. Another way in which he's ahead. And then maybe the most amazing thing is he approximate, he has atmospheric perspective. We're gonna do the form analysis in just a couple minutes to finish up on the meeting. He has atmospheric perspective here, a blue hazy look the mountains further away. And this is like, you know, early evening, yeah, supposedly. So you could still see some little bit of light in the sky. So he's got atmosphere perspective. Now that he could have seen in ancient Roman villas. That, that's true. He could have, though there weren't many that 
you could have gone to back then. In the Renaissance, he started restoring them, but I don't know. So maybe he did that. What we can't say is the last fact about the meaning that makes this a century ahead of his time is that there is a very accurate freehand approximation. This is the only way to say, just say a, an accurate freehand approximation of scientific perspective over a century before it was invented. We know this painting is a, a fresco on the wall of a church. I did forgot almost. I did mean to start with that fact. It's a fresco, so it's part of the meaning on the wall of a church in Italy. Uh, of course, it'd be Italy. He's, he's Italian, right? Uh, so what you see here is we know this has been examined. There are no diagonal lines. He didn't secretly invent a technique and then keep it secret you know and it died with him and then a hundred years later another artist now that's there is no absolutely no vanishing point painted or drawn or etched into the wall it's been examined carefully you know with infrared what well, just say it's been carefully examined and we know he did not know how to use scientific perspective but he understood the concept he figured out the idea behind it a hundred, more than a hundred years before the first Italian painters in the Renaissance, it was around 1420 when that was discovered in Italy. So when you say he's a hundred years ahead of his time, he's, it's more like um, actually over a hundred years. He was the best painter of his lifetime. Okay, let's do the formal analysis here. Uh, we have the, you know, scene is, I would say, yeah, you have to say it's unbalanced toward the bottom because there's so much empty sky here. It almost feels balanced because of the number of angels in the sky, but technically, yes, you'd say it's not balanced toward the bottom, but it is roughly balanced left to right. Uh, it's dynamic. The, almost all the angels are totally dynamic in their poses, their body, you know, positions. And then this stone well, or rock, uh, what well, stone? It's not, not uh, rock. Yeah, that's the right word. Rock wall, or you can say stone wall if you want. Uh, and some of the warners, not all of them, these two, Peter and the other disciple next, standing next to him, those are stable, as are some of the other mourners. Uh, I'd say Jesus' body is mostly stable, almost straight across, you know, left to right. But the other mourners around him, all around him, the women on each side of him, they're, they're dynamic. So it's a mixture. And then we have, I already mentioned for space, but I'll repeat it, we have, I didn't actually complete that formal analysis of the technique of space. There is foreshortening on this uh, rock wall here, and to some degree, even on the shoulders of uh, this mourner here. Uh, so there is some diminishing size, of course, because the people's heads get smaller, like they should in, in the real human eyesight and the angels are smaller because they're they're not many figures you know half the human size they're all human size they're up in the sky they're smaller they're further away so there's diminishing size obviously overlapping foreshortening atmospheric perspective and to finish up that point the most important fact about the use of space in this is there is a free hand approximation of scientific perspective without actually using the technique that's to me the most mind boggling fact about this painting I've seen it. It's, it's, it's worth standing in front of for more than a few minutes to take all this in once you see the real thing. Colors, warm, of course, and cool mixed to the cool on Mary's gown and some of the other mourners like this one disciple and uh, these two women here, the purple gown here. Uh, but it's warm on the skin tones. In this case, it's not the greenish uh, lifelike or dead looking flesh. So those are warm skin tones. The rock wall is, is warm and the angels in the sky are mostly warm, but the sky itself and the cliffs across the canyon there, you have to say canyon or valley, uh, those are of course all cool um, in the sky, obviously in the canyon, mostly specifically blue colors. Now here there is bold outline on some of the figures. You'd have to say the main figures in the foreground, Jesus himself, right? Get up close, definitely. And around the heads at least, if not the backs, Actually, this woman's back has a bold outline too. So there is bold outline around the main human figures in the foreground and then thin outline uh, around the figures uh, in the middle ground and background and the angels in the sky. Uh, Simia texture is superb on the hair, the skin, the clothing, the rock wall. And that's all done with painted line, not carved uh, line, of course. 
Um, and the largest mass, well, that's hard to say. I mean, is this one mass here, this group of mourners, or are these four women and Jesus's body, actually it's five women, and his body all one mass? If so, that's the largest mass. Or if you take each human figure separately, he, you be the judge if it's on the exam, as they say, it has a high possibility. And you're analyzing this, I, I'll be flexible. Some people would feel it's a, the rock wall. It's, it's a single mass, clearly. Maybe that's the largest mass. And then it might be these two uh, mourners because, I mean, well, they are mourners and disciples. As you can see, almost their entire bodies, Peter and his uh, companion there, his, his fellow <laughs> disciple. Uh, Jesus' body would be maybe even larger, but you can't see the middle part, so it's up to each person to decide there. Okay, uh, and uh, it's, I think I've covered, let's see, balance, the rhythm, um, outline, color, texture, modeling, space. I think we covered all of it. Okay, um, so I'm going to do this if you don't mind, because if I don't, I have to do this weird thing where you end up with, I'm going to take less. If you have questions, please just let me do this one thing that would be whoops sorry st luke's church because it didn't get recorded i'll keep it brief i won't do the long version that i had done before the recording okay but for people who are watching this and for you those who want to go back and review all of you even here tonight it could be beneficial so it's on the same <coughs> recording um, okay st luke's church is again st like the abbreviation for st luke L-U-K-E apostrophe S, yes. church, the location of Virginia, the state, 1632. This is a late Gothic building, an authentic medieval late Gothic building in Virginia, the first uh, American colony, uh, which was built by people who grew up in the 1500s in England and therefore were used to seeing Gothic churches and were even back in England when they were you know, either uh, children or young adults or even middle-aged, some of them came over as, as people in their 40s and 50s, they would have helped build buildings like this in their own towns in rural England and even parts of London. The Gothic style was still being used well into the 1600s. So this, in other words, the point is, is not a revival of Gothic. It's an authentic late medieval Gothic building in North America. And what makes it Gothic are the main features, of course, that we can see that Gothic architecture always had. Pointed arched windows here, all of them are. The door is too, but it's underneath this rounded arch, so that's the only non-Gothic detail. A tall tower with a tapering spire. I know it doesn't taper much, but it does, which is a point. Uh, and then we have um, the um, rose window is on the back. I have to show that in another slide. If it's on exam, this will be the view. There's a small, it may be tiny, but it's there. It's a round row, uh, stained glass window. And then the, the buttresses, the buttresses here. This is a, a later, earlier slide that I took several years ago, but you can see them in this slide. The buttresses are not flying buttresses, but it's not that big a building. It doesn't require that kind of buttress. So those are clasping buttresses. Inside the original pews are still being used. It's a functioning church. It has been for nearly 400 years still. It has services every Sunday, and it's also a historic landmark. I believe it's on the UNESCO World Heritage List, and it's definitely a national historic landmark. Open to the public several days a week for visits, and then has a church services also welcoming anyone who wants to participate. And I don't know if they ever get <laughs> an overflow crowd. I'm not sure what they do. But when I've been there twice, uh, one time there was a church service, and it was very nice. The original organ brought over from England made in the 1500s under Queen Elizabeth, as uh, were perhaps the pews handmade in England, carved out of wood and, and brought over by ship, and the original choir loft where the choir would stand, and the beam ceiling, all of that's original. The only thing that was replaced or repaired uh, were the windows. The stained glass got blown out in the hurricane. And then it has one last architectural feature that is uh, somewhat medieval. You see in Holland, these stepped gables, which the Dutch gables, the other word for that, look a little bit like the ones in Amsterdam, where they first were used in very, not just Amsterdam, but Dutch cities. And the bricklayers of England, I actually did mention this for the first time, they had learned those techniques by apprenticing, you know, um, going to Holland and learning how to do brickwork. The best bricklayers in Europe clearly are the Dutch. They've been making brick buildings out of brick houses, churches, city halls for centuries before 
uh, these colonists uh, would have come sometime before they came to Virginia in the early 1600s. Many of them would have gone to Holland to learn the craft, you know, to become a skilled bricklayer. And it shows in the details here. It's a remarkable structure. And so it is the last fact about the meaning. It is the only intact, authentic Gothic church uh, left in what's now the United States. And even the cemetery is original. Those grave markers, not all of them are that old, but some of them go back to the early 1600s and people that died right after the first colony in Virginia. And they were, you see the dates of their birth way back as far as the early 1500s or mid 1500s. Some of them were born when Queen Elizabeth was just a child. So it's also the oldest uh, European, of course, you have to say that, graveyard in the, what's now the United States. Okay, formal analysis, warm colors, warm red brick and warm uh, <coughs> you know, wood color on the wooden shingles. Uh, the stained glass you can't see, but of course it'd be a mixture of warm and cool colors. The only thing cool uh, on the whole outside are the, the plaster detailing around the doorway there and that one porthole window. The rhythm is obvious with the buttresses, the stepped gables, uh, the Gothic tracery, that's the right word or trim if you prefer that, in the windows, the, all the pointed arches. Uh, and then it's stable on the tower, dynamic on the high gable roof line, right? And the point arch windows and then stable on the buttresses and the outer walls. Uh, the largest mass is definitely the tower and then the nave, it's really only two sections. And the space is, the tower is about 50 feet tall. I think it's slightly over, this is like 52 feet to say a little over 50 feet or about 50 feet is good enough. And then uh, the ceiling inside is, Actually, I said it was nearly 40. It's more like 35 feet. That's, that's good. About, about 35, 36 feet on the inside. And it's one large open room inside. There is a smaller room, but you can ignore that fact. There's no modeling. It's just the shadows from the sun. And the line here is you can't see it on the window. So it's just visual light at the corners. Um, and is it balanced? Well, left to right, yes as most Gothic churches, both in Europe and this one here in Virginia are. Uh, but left to right, uh, I'm sorry, I meant top to bottom, left to right is balanced, it's symmetrical, uh, but it's weighted toward the bottom because of the narrow, relatively narrow width of the tower compared to the main building behind it. So unbalanced toward the bottom. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is thank you for your patience and stick around like I always have. And let's now do, I think I've covered everything here. I didn't forget anything, color, texture. Oh, I didn't finish with the texture. Ah, I almost forgot. The textures are real. There's no cemented texture. Real rough brick, real rough wood shingles, and real smooth glass. Those are the real textures. Okay, so I'm going to stop the share and then stick around to answer any questions anybody has uh, about anything relating to what we covered tonight or extra credit. I'm going to send you an email to remind you of the deadlines. The test, you really want to be here next week for the whole, and we'll, we'll just go right through because we don't need to take a break. We can end even earlier and, and unless you want to take a break uh, next week, but you want to be here for the whole class because we are going to cover the test, how it's, you know, going to be given and review the number of slides that will be cut from that list on the syllabus, as well as the number of definitions or terms to know. I'll cut both by, well, it's in writing, so you can see for yourself, I put it in writing, um, we'll cut by at least 40% both lists, and that will remove the need for you to even think about those slides. Okay, um, and extra credit, I'll give you the extension I already mentioned at the beginning, but just for those who joined us late, maybe. Uh, I'll give you until the deadline for the exam, the, the final, which will be 5 p.m. on Saturday, the Saturday after the test. It'll be posted 48 hours before that, after it's given in real time. So you want to be here for the test. So in case you decide you want to go back, you have that option. And you can, of course, double check with me about questions as long as they're not about what the answers are. It's an open book test. You should all be able to, if you took good notes, you should be able to get a good grade on that. And extra credit options will will remain open. I'll remind you of that uh, up through the end of that uh, week, well, Saturday at 5 p.m., the same deadline will apply. 
as is the deadline to submit the test after it's been posted on YouTube. Okay, anybody have any other questions about anything? Extra credit, grades? I still have a few people haven't given me your late papers and that's my last announcement tonight. Please, if you're one of those, try to get it in before the next class and if possible, even by say Sunday. So then I can get it back to you and you'll know where you stand grade wise before we review for the final and before you start studying. Uh, okay, because that is the cutoff. I do need late papers no later than the end of next class. I'll remind you of that. That knows I won't accept during final exams that last few days. I have too much to do. The, the grades all have to be submitted by um, uh, four, I think it's 10 p.m. or something on June 4th. So after Memorial Day, I hope everyone takes that day off and relaxes. We teachers will only have uh, three days really in essence because you can't do the grades and submit them all on the same day to get all the, the, the grading done for all our students in all our classes. And I don't want to submit them late. I want you to get your grades on time. So when you open your portals on the Monday after, I think that's June 8th, 4th, 6th, I think that's right. <laughs> I think it's June 8th you'll be able to see your all your grades for your transcripts and transfers or whatever purpose. Okay, one more time. Anybody have any questions about anything related to the class, the grades, your grade, extra credit, or tonight's lecture? Thank you guys for your patience. I can't thank you enough for, for sticking with those first few minutes when you probably figured out what was going on. It took me more than another two or three extra minutes and we started what four minutes late so i apologize one more time i make sure it doesn't happen in the last two classes of course and thank you all for your persistence and your participation okay anybody have any questions anybody oh, else? yes i don't thank you all right thank you you guys take care have a good week see you next wednesday thank you yeah you too good night